Hi there, welcome to the sixth week of our course, Elements of Literature and Creative Communication. Last week, we discussed uh, Indian English poetry, beginning with its uh, roots. We traced Indian English poetry through the poetry of uh, Nizam Ezekiel, Arun Kolatkar, Dilip Chitre, Arabindo, Kamla Das, and all these poets. And uh, now, in this week, we are going to discuss uh, contemporary world poetry. Before we discuss contemporary world poetry, we need to understand the concept of uh, world literature as such, because in the traditional disciplines of humanities and social sciences, world literature or studies related to world literature are gaining popularity these days. Therefore, let us uh, quickly take a look at uh, the concept of world literature itself and then move on to contemporary world poetry. Uh, the moment we talk of world poetry as uh, a distinguished uh, discipline in the humanities in general and literature in particular, we invariably think of uh, Goethe because uh, the concept of world literature as we understand the term today is uh, attributed to Goethe. And uh, Goethe, as all of us know, was the national poet of Germany. He was not just a poet, again, a versatile uh, personality. He was uh, a playwright, a novelist, scientist, statesman, all these things. So, the contribution of Goethe to uh, German society and culture is invaluable and therefore, he is rightly considered uh, you know, uh, the father of German literature in a broad sense of course. Other words, uh, he is considered as a national poet of Germany. Uh, as, a, as a concept, you know, world literature as a concept is uh, something like a cultural expression of a political, geopolitical world order, you know, one in which the world has moved beyond narrow confines of nationalism and colonialism. And uh, of course, these were uh, what dominated uh, these uh, colonialism and nationalism dominated the 19th century discourse as a kind of uh, breaking away from that kind of uh, imperialistic discourses, world literature emerged. So, that is the background in which world literature emerges. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, it begins a story, we can uh, discuss the origin of uh, Goethe's concept of world literature as a kind of a story. Sometime in uh, 1827, uh, Goethe was interacting with uh, his uh, uh, secretary, come friend, come confidante and all that called, uh, you know, his friend uh, come confidante was Johann Eckermann. One day when Johann Eckermann, as usual, when he went to meet uh, Goethe, uh, he found uh, Goethe in a, a peculiar mood. So, he asks him the reason behind that and that is when Goethe says, in fact, uh, before uh, Eckermann entered the room, Goethe had just finished reading a Chinese novel, obviously in translation. Of course, it is also true that uh, Goethe was a polyglot. But this particular Chinese novel was available to him through an English translation and he had just finished reading it. And he said uh, something remarkable about uh, Chinese uh, literature and Chinese novel. And Ekerman thinks uh, that it must be really unusual because remember uh, in the West, the concept of novel was uh, you know something uh, late 16th century or early 17th century. Whereas, uh, in most of uh, the Eastern traditions, including India, our first ventures into the very genre of novel or in the form of novel were quite earlier. Therefore, uh, Goethe remarks that, you know, no, in fact, uh, the concept of novel is uh, quite, uh, you know, old as far as Chinese culture was concerned. And by then, of course, he was also familiar with uh, works of Kalidasa, especially Shakuntala. And he was, uh, I mean, greatly influenced by the Persian poet Hafez. So, backed by his understanding and familiarity with all these writers, Goethe remarks to Ekman that national literature is now a rather unmeaning term. It has lost its uh, significance because the epoch of world literature is at hand and all of us must strive to hasten its approach. 
So this is uh, the remark that uh, Goethe makes, the first remark, and that's when he uses the term in Germany, Welt Literature, you know, world literature. That's how world literature, the concept of world literature was born somewhere in a remote uh, uh, village or a small town in Germany called Weimar in 1827, all right. Uh, in order to understand the significance of the term, well, generally speaking, world literature in a contemporary sense refers to literary works that are translated into multiple languages and circulated to a wider audience outside their society of origin. Let us say, for instance, if a Hindi work is written, when it gets translated into Kannada, when it gets translated into Bangla, when it gets translated into Persian, when it gets translated into Japanese, that is when it has uh, gained a kind of a wider circularity. So, that is when we can say that it has entered, the work of Hindi has entered into the portals of uh, world literature. So, that is a commonsensical understanding. But in other words, uh, it is a sum total of all national literatures, we can say that, you know, world literature is a sum total of all national literatures. And uh, as far as a uh, literary perspective uh, and awareness is concerned, it creates a new cultural dawn, it, con it creates a new literary dawn. And uh, in terms of emergent global modernity, of course, we live in that, uh, you know, it also uh, refers to uh, a kind of uh, literature where the entire world becomes its reader, you know. Remember, we are living in a world thanks to the technological interventions, we are living in a world that has uh, shrunk the globe into a village. That is why we call it a global village, right. Therefore, everybody should have uh, access to any great work of art. So, the term signifies all these uh, important concepts. World literature also has, uh, you know, its supporters in the works of Fritz Stretch and Marx and Engels especially, you know. Marx and Engels, uh, you know uh, uh, their important uh, contribution. In fact, Marx and Eng Engels uh, considered their manifesto, you know, to be a work of world literature. Uh, it comes out sometime in 1830s and 40s. So, they considered their manifesto as a, a prototype of uh, world literature. That is why you find Marx and Engels remarking. Uh, making a remark that world literature is the quintessential literature of modern times. And they have understood the pitfalls of uh, national one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness and therefore, as a kind of a way out, uh, they propose the concept of uh, world literature. And today, more than looking at world literature as a sum total of all the works that are available in, uh, uh, you know, available for reading to the entire population of the globe, we consider world literature more as a kind of a network, a network of ideas, cultural exchanges and things like that. Yeah, uh, David Damroche, uh, a remarkable scholar and a professor uh, in the University of Harvard, has a major role to play in revitalizing the concept of world literature in the contemporary times. Especially in the 21st uh, millennium, he has played a major role in popularizing world literature as a distinct discipline to be studied across the globe in various uh, departments of literatures and languages. You know. He defines uh, uh, world literature as something that encompasses all literary works that circulate beyond their culture of origin, either through translations or maybe in their original language, because if there is a, a reader who can read Hindi even outside India, even then, of course, the work in Hindi has gained an audience outside India. And through that reader, it might as well reach other readers. So, we can say that is entered the portals of world literature as such. So, he identifies, Damroche identifies uh, two stages through which a work of art enters into uh, a global domain, you know two rites of passage in order for a work to be considered world literature. First, by being read as great literature, you know, it should be considered as a classic or a great work of art in the 
language in the region in the culture in which it is written and second by circulating out into a broader world beyond its linguistic and cultural point of origin. Of course, here we make use of uh, translation and other things. Uh, here comes his uh, important works as far as world literature is concerned beginning with his uh, work what is world literature which was published in 2003. He went on to write how to read world literature and later in 2014 world literature in theory. Okay? So, he goes on to say that world literature is a mode of socio-political, literary, cultural circulation and reading. And of course, like there is never a set of the canon of world literature. The intention behind world literature is not to create a new canon of literature as such. Instead, you know, like there is no single way of reading a text, there is also no single way of defining world literature. Broadly speaking, any great work of art, you know, that by virtue of translation or by virtue of extensive readership has gone beyond the point of its origin and is available to the reader of the world is called world literature as such. The moment we say world literature, a couple of uh, uh, concerns come to our mind. The first quench concern is what happens to authenticity. Well, there are many critics who say that you know the moment you take a work out of its uh, particular locale. Remember, we said that a work of art is a product of a cultural background in which it is written. The tradition, an entire tradition, an entire society, culture, fauna, flora, everything will have gone into making a particular work of art. So, when you take it out of its context, what happens? Does it lose its authenticity? Does it uh, lose its specificity? So, these are some questions. Therefore, allaying these fears and concerns, uh, proponents of world literature say that you know rather than losing a work gains when it becomes a part of uh, world literature. Of course, in the process it has to necessarily undergo certain transformations or metamorphosis through global circulation. It is not that uh, the work would be received. Let us say for instance, there is a classic uh, written in Kannada literature. It is not that when it is translated and published outside Karnataka, it will be received in the same way it was received in uh, Kannada. It is no, it has to undergo certain transformation and in the process it is bound to lose a few things and it is also bound to gain a few things. So, these are the natural things and that is why in fact, Walter Benjamin a renowned uh, you know translator, translator scholar, translator theorist. He goes on to coin the term called uh, afterlife through translation a work uh, acquires an afterlife you know because if we consider a work in the source language as having life when you translate that work then what happens that work gains an extra lease on life or it appears as a kind of a uh, an alter life it appears in the form of an alter life in another language right therefore uh, it gains to uh, when a work of art enters uh, part of world literature, it gains an afterlife. You can also consider it as that. World literature also becomes uh, an extraordinary tool, a remarkable tool in analyzing globalization. You know, we are struck in uh, the concept of globalization. It has a lot many ramifications. Uh, globalization has been studied extensively from uh, uh, an economic point of view, from sociological point of view, but not so much from cultural and literary point of view. Therefore, world literature provides uh, an interesting set of tools to look at the concept of globalization in a fresh perspective, from a cultural perspective. This is where we can uh, come to the concept of uh, literature as a single living organism. This is uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, concept. Like Gyothe, Rabindranath Tagore too uh, understood, had understood the concept uh, value of world literature quite at an early stage. Maybe right in 1903, he seemed to have remarked that uh, cutting across the national boundaries, literature as such exists as a single organism in an interconnected uh, universe. Therefore, you know, uh, it becomes a part of the global tradition. So, these are a couple of concerns that uh, we can 
keep in mind as far as world literature is concerned when it enters uh, through translation. Yeah, Goethe, uh, continuing our discussion of uh, Goethe, uh, Goethe was uh, when, I mean, he was not very happy reading his own works and uh, uh, criticism of, of his works in uh, German. That is when he seemed to have remarked, I do not like to read my Faust anymore in German, you know. But on the other hand, he is interested in its uh, appearance, let us say in French, because in French it acquires a fresh uh, taste, a fresh color and in a, in a different spirit. Therefore, you know, when a writer comes across his own works, having appeared in a different language, it is going to revitalize the spirit of the writer as well and moreover, a work will reveal several features that uh, were hidden even from the author, you know. So, that is why I said that, you know, uh, when a work of art enters world literature portal, it is going to reveal very many things, all right. So, and of course, here comes the concept of mirroring, when more than a reflection, what happens uh, when a work gets translated into other languages and thereby enters uh, the parlance of world literature, it acquires a kind of a refraction, you know, more than reflection of the original work or the so called source work, it, there is a, a refraction of that and uh, that is when it provides uh, new uh, insights to the writer who has uh, written this, okay. Uh, yeah, this is uh, for all his pride in his own achievements and those of his fellow friends, Goethe has an uneasy sense that German culture is provincial. Of course, that is what major writers felt, right? Even Tagore was quite skeptical of uh, the entire nationalistic fervor. Therefore, he proposes the concept of cosmopolitanism, you know, through his poetry, he proposes uh, universalism, you know, the, you know the, an individual as a product of uh, uh, universal, uh, you know, uh, an individual more than a nationalistic uh, 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 dimension, an individual should appear as a kind in, in a universalistic uh, dimension, that is when he or she can grow, that is that was Tagore's concept, that was true of uh, Goethe as well. And, uh, all these great, great writers at one point of time, when they were really fed up of uh, the provincial culture, nature, criticism, that is when they aspire that their work uh, grows out of the national borders and uh, reaches uh, a wider audience across, okay. That is why we say that uh, a work when it enters uh, world literature acquires a new lease in life, it is a new horizon for a work, right. It is a new horizon for a work. So, one of the poets who translated from uh, uh, English into Kannada, B. M. Srikanthaya, he says that, you know, in his uh, preface to his translation, which is also in the form of, uh, at, uh, of a poem, you know, he says uh, what he has done through these translations is to look at, uh, you know, to, to, to decorate Kannada using the clothes of English and see how the Kannada lady looks and things like that. So, in other words, what he is talking of is, you know, a cross fertilization between two cultures, two literatures and as a, uh, as a result, a new, a new lease in life that uh, literary work uh, gains. And it is also, of course, uh, a very important thing when a work gets censored in one part of the globe, obviously, because of its virtue of being world literature or as by virtue of being a part of world literature, it can be read in other parts. So, when a particular regime tries to suffocate uh, a literary work, it finds a new life, a new birth in other languages, all right. So, these are some advantages of it. Of course, it is not any, any concept has its flip sides too. Therefore, uh, many critics, uh, many prominent ones uh, including uh, Gayatri Spivak are not very happy with this kind of sudden spurt in world literature and all that. Therefore, I mean they feel that, you know, there is a kind of uh, an erasure of uh, local literary traditions and cultures because remember, this is the guise in which imperialism was furthered, okay. Translation, we have already read extensively how through translations 
of the Orient, imperialist agenda was uh, uh, furthered. All right. Therefore, critics, uh, subaltern critics, uh, have every reason to be anxious of uh, the fact that through the guise of world literature, neo-colonial neo agenda might as well be creeping in, and they fight might be robbing our our own native cultures. So it has a valid fear, and moreover. Well, when you say world literature, uh, what do you mean by world literature? Probably you are talking of uh, uh, you know when a work is available in English, that is when it becomes world literature because otherwise how does it happen? It is not that uh, you know a work of art uh, though it is written in uh, Bangla or uh, you know Odia, it becomes a part of world literature. Of course, unless through translation there is no way through which a local word becomes uh, world literature. So, in other words, it is like surrendering to European American tastes and standards. So, if a work of art does not fit into that standard, however great that work of art may be in a local culture that does not become a greater work. Say for instance, that is how a poet such as Bendre in the Kannada context, you know we call him, uh, his poetry is as good as poetry of Pablo Neruda. Whereas, because his works are not translated properly and of course, they are so steeply rooted in the native culture that it becomes difficult to translate them into English successfully. And even if you translate them, they become caricatures. right? Therefore, through the process of translation, we also have, I mean we also have to run the risk of losing our canons into secondary works. That is when the world may perceive it as secondary work. whereas in the in the culture that has produced it, their extraordinary works. So these are some concerns that we have. Uh, however, uh, by keeping these concerns in hand, we have to discover ways of uh, moving ahead and uh, making available our great works of uh, literature into a wider audience. So these are some things that we have to keep in mind. Keeping this spirit, what we are going to do in this week, we are going to take up some extraordinary, extraordinary works that are written in different uh, regions, different uh, national cultures, different provincial cultures and fortunately uh, which are available in English and we are going to discuss some of these uh, works so that we also get a taste of how they sound. You know. So keeping the spirit of world literature in mind, we are going to introduce uh, world poetry through translation. Uh, so, next class we come up with uh, uh, some major uh, global poetry available to us in English translation. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.